Hello, welcome to Memo's weekly review show with me, Nassim Ahmed. Joining me is our regular guest, Moin Rabbani. In today's show, we'll be discussing the decision to suspend funding to UNRWA, the United Nations Reliefs and Work Agency. Israeli ministers attend March in support of ethnic cleansing in Gaza. We'll be speaking about also the Friday's judgment by the ICJ over South Africa's genocide case against Israel. And the more recent news of three American soldiers who were killed in Jordan. And we'll be asking, is it time for us to start describing the US as Israel's proxy? So that's for later, but let's begin with um, with the uh, suspension of funding to Onarwa Moin. Um, it said that the fundings will run out within weeks, and that's quite a shocking news. Um, especially given the context um, on which this decision has been taken, and also the fact that the allegation is that only 12 members of UNRWA staff out of 30,000 has been allegedly linked to the 7th October attack. What do you make of that? Yes, I mean, it's a big deal. As, as, as you um, just said, UNRWA has indicated that it will not be able to provide its vital and now urgently needed services in the Gaza Strip um, past um, the end of February at the latest because of these funding cutoffs. Um, I have to say this is a quite extraordinary um, story because 12 UNRWA staff members have been accused by Israel of being connected to the Hamas attacks of um, of 7 October 2023, there has been absolutely no allegation that UNRWA as an agency was in any way involved or had any knowledge of, of the um, alleged involvement of these 12. Uh, there has as yet been nothing beyond allegations, unproven, yet to be investigated, no trials, no convictions, Yet the United States, the United Kingdom, the e European Union, and a growing number of uh, European governments, including, I believe, also Australia and Canada, reacted almost instantaneously by suspending their funding to this agency in the immediate aftermath of the ruling by the International Court of Justice um, that there needs to be reliable and increased provision of life-saving humanitarian supplies to the civilian population of the Gaza Strip. I know we'll be speaking about the ICJ um, later. At this point, I'd just like to say that I think these two developments are very much connected. Israel has been sitting on these allegations for a long time. It chose to release them um, almost immediately after the ICJ uh, provisional ruling, um, interim ruling, came out this past uh, Friday. So it was quite clearly an exercise in diverting attention. And I think Western states uh, responded quite simply, oh, you think international law also applies to us? Well, here you go. Um, in exchange, you're going to get famine in the Gaza Strip. I think that's one aspect of it. Another one is is just um, uh, the sheer hypocrisy of it all. As Sarah Leah Whitson, the former Middle East director at Human Rights Watch, and now the executive director of um, Democracy for the Arab World Now, Don noted in a Twitter post, it took U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken seconds to respond to these unproven allegations and immediately cut off aid to um, UNRWA but in response to the ICJ's ruling that Israel now stands plausibly accused of genocide, let alone the tens of thousands of, of dead and wounded uh, since October of last year and the systematic raising of large areas of the Gaza Strip uh, to the ground, there's been nothing. You know, the weapons consignments continue without um, proper review by the U.S. Congress. The vetoes uh, have continued and, and so on and so forth. I thought the response of Chris Gunnis, uh, 
the former spokesperson uh, of UNRWA was quite fitting. Um, he compared these allegations to uh, the case of Lucy Letby, uh, the National Health Service uh, nurse who was convicted of murdering um, a series of infants under her care in British hospitals. And in her case, she was able to um, conduct these murders precisely because she was working in NHS facilities. Well, no one has suggested these murders were committed by the NHS or that the NHS had any knowledge of them or that the NHS is in any way responsible for them. So the equivalent would be the British government in response to um, the initial allegations against Lucy Letby severing all funding uh, to the NHS. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. Yeah, and to add to that, um, what about the hundreds of Israeli soldiers who have made genocidal statements, Israeli leaders who have made genocidal statements? Uh, so it very much feels like collective punishment um, against the Palestinians. Uh, but the real effect is that um, that means as much as $667 million of worth of pledges will not be received by an Arwa. That's 60% of its budget. And um, that's a, it's, it's a lot considering what they're having to deal with right now. Um, but this is not the first time, of course, Anara has been attacked. Anara has been a main target for the Israelis. For many, many years, uh, during the Trump era, uh, Trump uh, cut off funding, Biden reinstated, and now again done what no one would have imagined was follow Trump again in defunding Anarwa. Why do you think Anarwa has constantly been targeted by the Israelis since its founding in 1948? Uh, um, some of our viewers may not know the history behind it, but why is Anarwa such a, why does it receive such a hostile response from the Israelis? No, oh, I, I, th I think that's precisely the issue that needs to be addressed. Um, before answering you, um, I'd just like to elaborate um, just a little bit on on your reference to um, uh, Biden and Trump, which is that when the Biden administration uh, took office, it pointedly refused to reverse any of the initiatives that the Trump administration had taken with respect to uh, Palestine. Um, it did not relocate the US embassy to Israel back to Tel Aviv from Jerusalem. It did not reopen the US consulate in East Jerusalem, which served primarily as its direct line of communications um, to the Palestinians. It did not allow the reopening of the PLO mission in Washington. It did not reverse the recognition of Israeli sovereignty um, uh, over uh, Jerusalem and the recognition of the Israeli annexation of East Jerusalem and of the Syrian Golan Heights. The only divergence from Trump's multiple initiatives that was taken by the Biden administration was, as you mentioned, to resume funding to um, uh, the UN Refugee Agency for Palestine Refugees, UNRWA. And now that has been made consistent with Trump's policy as well. So Biden's uh, policy towards Israel and Palestine is now literally indistinguishable from that of the Trump administration. Up to and including, I should add, that the Biden administration has prioritized Arab-Israeli normalization over resolving the question of Palestine, prioritized Arab-Israeli normalization at the expense of resolving the question of Palestine, exactly uh, as, as a Trump administration sought to do. Now, getting back to your question, I think the issue here is that Israel, um, many members uh, in the US Congress, and to a certain extent in Europe as well, have for many years been arguing that the Palestine refugee question does not really exist. These people are not legitimate refugees. These people have no claim or right of return. Um, these people should simply be resettled in other countries and um, basically uh, shoved into the dustbin of history, put down the memory of all, if you will. And part of this argument is that these um, 
Palestinians are not even fully aware of their own rights. They do they, they, their claims are artificial. Their identity as refugees is artificially constructed. And who is um, uh, who do they consider the main culprit in this fantasy uh, scenario? It is UNRWA. Um, Palestinian refugees are seen as these ignorant, passive, unknowing collection of individuals who, were it not for UNRWA, would have no identity, uh, no claims upon their rights, uh, no collective agency. But it is somehow UNRWA, which after all is a humanitarian agency with no political mandate, that is somehow held responsible for the persistence of the refugee question. In other words, it's not Israel's denial of their rights, but UNRWA's very existence that is responsible for the persistence of these um, uh, issues. So UNRWA serves very much as the main and most visible surrogate for a much broader agenda, which is the effort to liquidate and eliminate the Palestinian refugee question. Um, and, and that, I think, is a prior, primary motivation for these decades of attacks upon the agency that you've referenced. Yeah, and the next story we want to tackle is very much linked to what you've been saying about Palestinians being denied their right to nationhood as a people, as a um, as a nation with long tradition and connection with Palestine is what happened in Israel over the weekend. Yesterday, actually, 12 Israeli ministers, uh, a third of the current um, ministers, they took part in a mass rally um, wanting to ethnically cleanse and expel Palestinians from Gaza. Again, it goes back to the fact that Israelis, many Israelis don't consider Palestinians to be uh, a real nation, a real people with connection to Palestine, which is why they can advocate for such policies of resettlement, of expulsion, uh, as you've mentioned. So it seems um, despite Washington's um, condemnations, uh, ethnic cleansing is still high on the agenda as far as the current Israeli cabinet is concerned. Yes, I mean, I, I should point out um, it's not official government policy, also, although virtually every Israeli official has it one point in the past few months advocated for this policy. But what you had here was a gathering of several thousand people that, as you mentioned, was attended by um, a third of the Israeli cabinet and was addressed by two of Israel's most prominent ministers, the Minister of National Security, Itamar ben Gvir, and the Minister of Finance. Um, uh, Bezalel uh, Smutrich. I mean, it would be the equivalent of the Home Secretary and the Chancellor of the Exchequer addressing a gathering in London and then um, having to be told, oh, actually, this is insignificant and irrelevant. Don't, uh, don't take it seriously. Well, it doesn't work that way. And their agenda was twofold. Um, first, as you mentioned, to um, rejuvenate this agenda of the ethnic cleansing of the Gaza Strip. And it was very explicitly stated um, that these Palestinians in the Gaza Strip need to be moved out of the Gaza Strip. And secondly, um, and not less importantly, the revival of the Jewish settlement project in the Gaza Strip. And again, this was all very explicitly stated. I think there are several dimensions to this. Part of it is um, that the Israeli far right sees um, this as a winning electoral agenda. And of course, most Israeli politicians now have come to the conclusion that new Israeli elections, or at least new coalition negotiations, may be in the offing sooner rather than later, um, because Netanyahu's uh, position as prime minister is becoming increasingly untenable. And um, some believe that the main contest will be between, um, let's say, the establishment right, which is a Likud, and the far right represented by these um, fascist parties of uh, Ben Gvir and Smutrich. And although we make all these pretensions that we do these things and we say these things because we think we're powerful and can act independently and can show the middle finger to the entire world, including our 
sponsors in, in Brussels and Washington. We know we can do these things because Biden and Brussels have our back. Um, that's, I think, the first observation I would make. The second is it contra that the response contrasts very sharply um, with the response to the issue we've just discussed, namely the severance of funding to UNRWA. So it's perfectly acceptable to have a third of the Israeli government attending a rally that explicitly calls for the expulsion, the ethnic cleansing of the Gaza Strip and its colonization, illegal colonization um, by Jewish settlers. That's fine. We'll just pretend it didn't happen. And um, if we have to give a response, we'll try to characterize it as some kind of um, uh, fringe meeting. You know, but if 12 out of uh, whatever they are, 13,000 um, UNRWA employees uh, are accused of a crime, well, then we'll immediately seek to obliterate the entire agency. Let's just acknowledge if it happened yeah. in any other country, a third of the cabinet went to a march like this, we'll describe it what it was, you know, a, a, a fascistic campaign to ethnically cleanse but, uh, a, a people. That's how it would be described in any other scenario. But of course, here, there's a reluctance. Here it's, to... here it's democracy at work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let, let's turn our attention to the big story from last week. Um, from Friday, the International Court of Justice issued its judgment on, on um, the South Africa case, lodged by South Africa, I should say. Um, before we go into it, just give us some of your initial thoughts on the ICJ decision. I mean, did you expect it to be so swift? Is that a good sign? And your general uh, perspective on that? Well, I, I expected it to be reasonably swift um, because I looked at the precedents, um, the genocide cases involving Bosnia, um, Myanmar and Ukraine, and the initial ruling in those cases was um, within a roughly compar comparable time frame. I also think that um, the ruling issued by the International Court of Justice was on the whole consistent with those previous cases. Many people have pointed out the discrepancy between what the courts ordered with respect to uh, Palestine in comparison with Ukraine, but I think that is very much of an apple and oranges type scenario because the Ukraine case, although it was about genocide, was a fundamentally different case um, uh, than this one. The second um, reaction I would make is that don't confuse the ICJ with the UN Security Council. Um, the ICJ can offer a legal opinion that legal opinion can be binding on all member states, um, but it does not have any enforcement capabilities, nor are its rulings self-implementing. The only way its rulings can be enforced is if the UN Security Council adopts a resolution demanding compliance. And in this case, that's clearly not going to happen because of uh, the US veto at the Security Council. So, um, I think people were preparing to judge the judgment uh, of the ICJ, if you will, by whether or not it called for a ceasefire. That to me was a very secondary issue. Um, first of all, because the call for an immediate ceasefire would have been um, inconsistent with the two uh, most relevant precedents, namely Bosnia and Myanmar. And second of all, because it would have been just ink on paper. So it may have had symbolic value, but it would have changed literally nothing um, on the ground. Much more important, indeed, the central issue, in my view, was whether or not the court would rule that South Africa had plausibly accused Israel of committing genocide in the Gaza Strip. And it did. And it did so by an overwhelming majority. Um, and that to me is a game changer, not in terms of changing anything on the ground, um, but in terms of Israel taking one more step towards becoming a pariah state, uh, the way South Africa was in the 1970s and 1980s, and for that matter, the way Israel had been um, uh, 
uh, in, in the years uh, before the 1990, 1991 peace process uh, began. And the idea that Israel is now forever associated with genocide, um, not as a victim, but as a perpetrate, a perpetrator, has, in my view, enormous and permanent uh, significance. It's now become much easier um, for people to criticize Israel and its policies without being demonized and delegitimized and, and so on, the way that, um, or even criminalized in some cases, the way that has often been the case um, uh, in the West. It's going to become much more difficult um, to defend Israel. And it's going to be much more difficult, I think, to attack those who criticize uh, Israel. And another aspect is the ruling of the International Court of Justice is binding not only on South Africa and Israel, it is binding upon every state party to the 1948 Genocide Convention. That includes the United States, that includes Canada and Australia and New Zealand, um, that includes the United Kingdom, and that includes the member states of the European Union. And so, at least formally, in a legal sense, um, they will now have to ensure that their policies reflect the rulings, the provisional measures uh, ordered by the ICJ, and that their um, policies cannot be seen as complicity with uh, genocide in the Gaza Strip. I think their response, of course, has been very different, um, as we were discussing, to basically engineer famine in the Gaza Strip. In part, I think, which, 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 sorry, which makes the decision to suspend funding of UNRWA all the more strange because one of the requirements of the judgment is that um, Israel does everything to make sure humanitarian aid uh, reaches Palestinians, that humanitarian aid is not obstructed. And therefore, when you consider that UNRWA is the biggest aid aid organization delivering assistance to the Palestinians, how on earth are they supposed to meet those obligations? And, and just to add to that, I mean, you spoke about ceasefire. I mean, is it even possible to uphold or comply with the provisional measures with that, you know, without a ceasefire itself? I mean, that is the broader question. I don't think you can. That's one interpretation. I don't think you can, uh, you know, meet the requirements of the order from the ICJ without a ceasefire. That's one interpretation. And add to that, of course, you know, the cutting of funding to UNRWA, that just makes it seem like you're going completely against the uh, ICJ decision. Well, precisely. Um, and, and many people, including senior United Nations um, humanitarian uh, figures, such as Martin Griffiths and Philip Lazzarini, have made precisely this point, that there can't be aid deliveries under the current circumstances and in the absence of um, uh, a ceasefire, aid can't, aid can't be delivered. And I think a number of legal analysts have, have come to the conclusion that if you read the provisional measures properly, implicit in them is the call for a ceasefire. Um, at, you know, whatever that may be, the bottom line, I think, is on the one hand, what you've stated, on the other, that the court, for reasons of its own, chose not to explicitly order a ceasefire. And I think perhaps another reason it didn't do, do so is because South Africa did not ask um, the court to offer a judgment on the legality of Israel's military operations in the Gaza Strip. And the court, I think, took a decision um, not to wade into this political hornet's nest. But again, I think the key issue is that, you know, we can be disappointed, we can criticize the court for not having done that, but even if had even if it had fulfilled our highest expectations with regard to a ceasefire, unfortunately, it would have changed nothing on the ground. And therefore, in my view, much more important is that it has judged that South Africa has plausibly accused Israel of um, uh, genocide. Getting back to the other part of your question, you're you're exactly right. I mean, if there is no humanitarian aid to be delivered to the Gaza Strip, Israel can no longer be accused of obstructing um, uh, those deliveries. And I think in part also, 
you know, these Western governments know exactly what they're doing. Um, this is in part their 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 um, uh, their decision to suspend or cut off uh, funding to UNRWA is in part for the reasons we've discussed, and it's in part a retaliatory measure against South Africa and the International Court of Justice along the lines of oh. You're now going to um, uh, claim that international law applies to us and not only to others. Do you really think that Israel is going to be held accountable for anything and is not going to continue to act with impunity? Well, if that's if that's your view, enjoy your famine. I mean, one article I was reading this week. He also went as far as to say we're in a situation now where the clashes between the international legal system, international legal order against the uh, international U.S. hegemony. These are the two big clashes that's taking place between the uh, international law and between the law of U.S. hegemony. And I thought that was it's quite a powerful way to present what's happening right now with, with the ICJ. Um, I, I, for one, was... Um, um, was quite surprised because it surpassed my expectation. I did not expect such a positive verdict um, from the ICJ. And on the ceasefire question, I, I want to share this quote from someone, um, an activist, Ali Abu Nima, and I thought it was very um, carefully explained. He basically says that a ceasefire is what you demand in an armed conflict but in a genocide, you demand an immediate end to all genocidal act. And that is exactly what the ICJ ordered with the immediate uh, with immediate effect. So that's, that's well a, put. Yeah, that's a very, very well put uh, explanation why they wouldn't call for a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that struck me is the response from Washington and Israel's Western allies. Uh, there seems to be an attempt to gaslight the international community, everyone, we've heard what we've heard, we've seen the judgment, there seems to be a, an effort to completely spin this whole thing as a, as a success for Israel. But what, what do you make of that? Yes, I mean, you know, as, as you indicated, this is really um, uh, a contest, if you will, between the Western designed and constructed rules-based international order on the one hand, um, an order in which international law applies only to enemies and adversaries, um, whereas those who designed this order are free to violate it at will if it, if it serves their interests, that on the one hand, and the norms and principles and universal application of international law um, on the other. So you could look at it perhaps more broadly as the West versus the international community. And I think the distinction between those two um, is becoming um, increasingly clear and increasingly large. Secretary of State Antony Blinken dismissed South Africa's case as meritless before it was even presented, <clears throat> excuse me, before it was even presented um, to the ICJ. And in the aftermath of the ruling, uh, the White House spokesperson, um, John Kirby, um, made a point of informing the assembled press that the court had not found Israel guilty of genocide. Well, it had not been found not guilty of genocide either for the simple reason that the full and proper hearings on whether or not Israel um, is guilty of genocide, which have now been ordered to be held uh, uh, by the court, have not even started. So getting back to Lucy Letby, who we were discussing somewhat earlier, it would be the equivalent of declaring Lucy let be innocent on the first day of her trial because she had not yet been convicted. It's it's an, it's absurd. Finally, if I can make an additional point about um, the ICJ, of course, ICJ judges um, serve in their personal capacity and are formally at least independent in the sense that they're not diplomats who follow instructions uh, from their uh, capitals. Nevertheless, I, I found it quite fitting and, and quite interesting and, and, and in a sense also quite important that this judgment was delivered by an American judge, Joan Donahue, uh, in her capacity as, as the current president um, uh, of the court. 
in American English, extensively quoting um, uh, UN officials and documents uh, and so on. And I think, you know, um, that's the seedier American official, if you will, uh, that that we should uh, listen to, not um, uh, not Kirby or uh, or Blinken, and and just as importantly, I think it's also noteworthy, as as was pointed out uh, by Norman Finkelstein, that not only did Judge Donahue vote with the majority on every single measure, and it was an overwhelming majority, either sixteen to one or sixteen to two. But she did not feel compelled to offer an explanation of her position and of her vote in the way uh, that others did. So you have, for example, the American judge, excuse me, the German judge, uh, Nolte, who felt the need to um, uh, offer an explanation of his vote in which he um, sought to downplay South Africa's accusations and made the case that he didn't find South Africa's presentations um, convincing and that under different circumstances, he would have voted against um, all the uh, provisional measures and basically uh, would have argued to have, have the case dismissed, but that the level of incitement to genocide by Israeli leaders and officials tied his hands and left him with no choice. Um, the American judge did not feel the need to issue a statement um, uh, downplaying South Africa's presentation and explaining why she nevertheless um, voted uh, for them. And then, of course, you have the um, uh, the Ugandan judge who seems to have been in utter confusion about this case for two. Yeah, she's reasons. been disowned now, as or not. She's been disowned. Yes, she's by been her disowned government. by her own government. But again. I think um, you know she was she was not under an obligation to follow instructions uh, from her government, and 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 made that uh, very clear in in her explanation for her vote. She said um, that um, the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians is a I believe she referred to it as a territorial dispute that should be resolved by diplomacy and negotiations um, rather than in a court of law. Well, there's two problems with that. Is that. First of all, she was not asked to judge on a dispute between Israel and the Palestinians, but rather on a dispute between South Africa and Israel. And second of all, well, it may be um, uh, a territorial dispute or a political dispute or uh, a dispute that needs to be negotiated. The fact of the matter is that the reason this case landed on her desk is because it concerned a very specific legal document known as a 1948 convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide and to i mean pretend that um this has nothing to do with uh international law is really the height of absurdity hmm. um i know there are two different um institutions the international court of justice and the international criminal court um, there is an ongoing case at the ICC, but the ICC, sorry, but the current prosecutor seems to be dragging his feet. So do you think the ICJ decision will put pressure on Karim Khan to stop dragging his feet and start prosecuting Israeli officials? And what do you think? Well, I, I think it's a difficult question to answer because on the one hand, um, Karim Khan may respond to this by now dragging his feet even more as as you rightly point out these are two different institutions with two different um, uh, mandates and so on but he could hide behind this investigation to um, withhold from judgments on his own um, on the pretext that it might interfere with the um, uh, orderly the uh, process at at uh, at the ICJ. Um, on the other hand, um, it could result in sufficient public pressure for him to move forward. Now, just given his record, I'd I'd like to point to several possible scenarios. The first is that the ICJ case is only considering um, the case. Sorry, I'll repeat that. The first point is that the ICJ case 
is only considering the genocidal actions of Israel. It's only going to offer a judgment on whether or not Israel is guilty of genocide. That leave, and the reason that it's doing so is that um, the state of Palestine has not been accused of um, uh, genocide, and Hamas um, is not a state and is therefore not a party to the genocide convention. So Hamas is a movement can't be accused unless the state of Palestine is accused and um, uh, the state of Palestine is formally accused of responsibility for the actions of Hamas, much as in the Bosnia case, um, the Bosnian government um, uh, bought a case arguing that Serbia is responsible for the um, genocidal actions of the um, Bosnian uh, uh, Serbs in, within Bosnia. That leaves open the possibility that what Karim Khan will actually do is that he will seek to fill the gap, if you will, and begin to prosecute um, uh, individual Palestinians for commission of genocide on October 7th. Um, personally, I don't think the evidence um, in either intent or in fact is there for a case uh, of genocide against um, individual uh, Palestinians, but this may well be how he will proceed um, and then claiming, you know, that there needs to be proper balance and accountability and, and, and so on. Second point is that the International Criminal Court um, will only prosecute individuals in cases where the national judiciary has either failed or refused to hold individuals accountable for um, crimes of uh, crimes as defined by the Rome Statute. And I found it quite telling that on his recent um, uh, visit to Israel, and I should add, we've heard absolutely nothing from him on this issue since, I find it quite telling that on this um, visit, he provided fulsome praise to the Israeli judiciary, um, an Israeli judiciary that has been denounced and dismissed by every human rights in, uh, investigation that has looked into it has been denounced and dismissed as a sham that basically exists to legalize Israeli impunity in its dealings with uh, Palestinians and to whitewash Israeli crimes. Nevertheless, Karim Khan in his infinite wisdom found that this is a more or less perfectly functioning uh, judiciary capable of fulfilling its functions under the Rome Statute. What that means, um, that proceeding from that position, Karim Khan has offered himself a pretext not to prosecute any Israeli leaders or individuals for violations uh, of the Rome Statute because he will be of the view that um, the, they will be held accountable by the Israeli judiciary, and therefore, he will only be responsible for prosecuting Palestinians. I my sense is that that will be the general approach he will take. Of course, I'm I'm speculating. I don't have any inside knowledge, but I think that's the direction he's going in. And then he may also throw in a few Jewish settlers uh, from the from the West Bank, so that he's uh, not accused of a. Um, uh, I wish. There, yes, of a dereliction of duty that requires his dismissal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we spend a lot of time on the ICJ. Um, so let's uh, go on to the next story from the weekend. Next big story, actually. Three U.S. soldiers were killed in Jordan. Uh, there's been some confusion as to where exactly the attack came from. Um, but this seems to be another example of escalation and the war going not according to at least Washington's plan. Um, so, I mean, how shallow in your mind, um, you know, has the insistence on the Biden administration that this has nothing to do with Gaza? These are just terrorist organizations attacking Israeli interests and extremists who are orchestrated by Iran. I'm, I'm mean, sorry, Nassim, but um, uh, I think I had an internet problem and, and you froze for several seconds. If you okay. Can... All right. So let, let, me, let me repeat that. Okay. So let's start that again. 
So the, uh, we spend a lot of time on the ICJ. Uh, the next big story uh, from the weekend is the killing of three US soldiers in Jordan. Um, so that is another example of the escalation of the conflict. Um, Biden, as we know, has been saying that he wants to contain this. He does not want this to escalate. But then again, he's attacked uh, the Houthis. And this is another example of the escalation. Despite that, they keep insisting that this has nothing to do with Gaza. So how shallow, in your view, is this, the insistence by the ad Biden administration that it has nothing to do with Gaza? And also, is the war now taking a path which the extremists in Washington, extremists in Israel, extremists in other parts of the world are clearly hoping to achieve? Yes. I mean, you know, you look at Yemen, Ansar al-Law leaders have made explicitly clear from the very outset that the only reason they're engaging in these activities um, and attacks in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden and the Arabian Sea has to do with Gaza. It's exclusively because of Israel's genocidal onslaught and siege of the Gaza Strip. And the moment this onslaught and siege ends, their attacks will, will cease. Nevertheless, Washington insists on Allah doesn't know what it's talking about. Um, and that it really has nothing uh, to do with Gaza because um, Washington apparently has a better understanding of what the Houthis are doing than the Houthis themselves. Um, the other point is that as numerous analysts have been pointing out from the beginning, um, escalation may come deliberately, it may come inadvertently, um, but what they're all agreed upon is that the longer this goes on, the more likely escalation becomes, whether deliberate or inadvertent. And what we saw yesterday was a deliberate escalation. Um, and it happened uh, because um, we keep climbing up the escalatory ladder, uh, so to speak. And the longer this conflict continues, the higher up the escalatory ladder uh, we will go. So from the outset, the Biden administration has had a clear choice um, if you want to avoid further regional escalation, it is a very simple method to achieve that. Biden picks up his phone, he calls Netanyahu, as he did in 2021, and says, Bibi, you've run out of road. And within 24 hours, the entire thing comes to an end. This is not something the U.S. wants to do. The U.S. is deeply invested in Israel's um, genocidal onslaught and um, uh, and the success of its campaign, which appears ever more elusive. And therefore, the option that has been chosen by Washington is not to call for a ceasefire in Gaza, but to seek conflict with those who are themselves uh, engaging in armed operations in order to compel a ceasefire um, in the Gaza Strip. And this brings us every time one step closer to a full-scale um, uh, regional conflict. I think yesterday's attack is significant because it is the first one in which confirm in which US uh, the deaths of US soldiers, service members have been confirmed. And this makes it virtually inevitable, I think, that the US response will be significantly more escalatory than its previous responses to um, attacks on US uh, military facilities in Syria and Iraq, which did not result in the killings of US service members. And you had a long tweet um, on X uh, related to that. And uh, I, I very much want to ask you about one specific comment you made. I thought it was very insightful. You said that the US is functioning as Israel's proxy now fighting on multiple fronts, its soldiers dying to defend Israel and protect its ability to continue fighting in the Gaza Strip. So let's explain that for us. What do you mean by the statement that the US is becoming Israel's proxy? Well, I, I made this statement um, against the background of the US-Israeli strategic relationship and the way that this relationship is supposed to work like similar relationships um, uh, the U.S. maintains elsewhere in the world, is that the U.S. is a superpower and Israel is a proxy. Um, it is Israel 
that is supposed to um, uh, defend and promote U.S. influence and interests in the Middle East, not the other way around. Um, uh, so in a sense, um, the deal is that the U.S. guarantees Israel's security and um, Israel does the U.S.'s dirty work uh, in the region. That at least is a theory. The practice is that Israel has failed to keep its end of the bargain because Israel appears incapable of fulfilling its end of the bargain. It's now been um, uh, waging war in Gaza for well over 100 days, the longest war in Israeli history since um, 1948, 1949, and it still hasn't achieved anything. And we're not talking about um, Egypt or Hezbollah here. We're talking about uh, Hamas, which is not exactly the most um, powerful military force uh, in the region or Israel's most powerful adversary. And so um, rather than Israel ensuring that um, the Suez Canal remains open and that uh, Ansar Allah don't present a threat to uh, maritime uh, shipping at Bab al Mandab, uh, rather than Israel ensuring um, that uh, these groups associated with the axis of resistance um, no longer hit U.S. targets um, uh, in the Middle East. It is the U.S. that is having to come to the region and wage war in the Red Sea, um, in Iraq, in Syria. Is it primarily to defend direct U.S. interests? No, it is to ensure that Israel can continue unmolested with its genocidal onslaught um, uh, on the Gaza Strip. So, in a sense, the relationship has been reversed, and it is the U.S. doing Israel's dirty work rather than the other way around, as it's supposed to be. Um, but I should add that, you know, this, of course, is somewhat of a simplification, because I think if you if you look at it from the perspective of, of U.S. leaders in Washington, I think part of the problem is not that they, I don't believe they put Israel, Israeli interests ahead of American interests. I think that the real fundamental problem is that they are incapable of distinguishing between Israeli and U.S. interests. In other words, from their perspective, an Israeli success is an American success, and an Israeli failure is an American failure that will reflect negatively on the U.S. position regionally and geopolitically. And I think that's why they're so heavily invested uh, in this. But again, um, Israel is is failing to perform its assigned role. And I, you know, I also gave the example in the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, some of your viewers who have been there um, may recall that you would see these T-shirts being sold everywhere, um, emblazoned uh, with the image of an Israeli fighter jet and the slogan, don't worry, America, Israel is behind you. Um, and I concluded that, um, you know, given what we've seen in terms of the mediocrity of the Israeli military uh, these uh, past hundred plus days, that those T-shirts now can probably be obtained at a very steep discount. So that wraps up another episode. Um, that was my guest, Moin Robbani. Thank you for tuning in. See you next week for another episode of the Memo Review Show with me, Nasim Ahmed. Take care. Bye-bye.